Welcome to my PhD defense of this thesis entitled A Journey of Computer Vision Sports from Tracking to Orientation-Based Metrics. So before getting started, I want to thank my co-supervisors for being with me throughout all these four years. It has been a, a long ride, but it was worth it. So we have here with us today, like physically, uh, Gloria Aron Coloma Ballaste from the Image Processing Computer Vision Group in Universidad Punta Fabra. And I want also to thank the thesis committee for accepting my invite and being with us here today. In particular, as you said, uh, we have Michele Merle from IBM Research AI, also Patrick Lucy from Stats Perform and Dan Servone from Silos Analytics. So thanks once again, and I'm already looking forward to your questions afterwards. Um, so this is the outline of today's presentation of all the topics I will go through, but I want to start with a little bit of background and motivation because I'm doing a PhD in rather sports analytics in an image processing computer vision group. So let's see how this fits. Um, to be honest, I've been pursuing a sports analytics career since early in the 2000s, let's say. Uh, I started doing some fantasy basketball in my parents' teacher notebooks, tracking the performance of the players I, I like the most. So that was a solid start. Then I switched to, well, I attempted playing, but I, I was really bad and I had to quit like uh, pretty fast. I switched then to coaching and I've been coaching throughout my PhD as well in clubs such as Football Club Barcelona. And then I've also been teaching and disseminated the power of data uh, among uh, coaching staffs. So I've been teaching specific courses like this one from Improved Sports, but I've also been teaching in the Spanish Basketball Federation. So that being said, I want to merge my passion that it's basketball with also my audiovisual systems engineering background. Um, and I'm so devoted to sports analytics because I think it's pretty fascinating how you can generate a competitive advantage through data. So imagine here we have uh, an organization, so one club, basketball club, let's say. We have GMs, so general managers or board of directors. Then we have coaching staff. And finally, we also have players. All these agents here in this picture have one shared goal, that is winning as many games as possible. They do this through different tasks or processes. Let's see, namely, GMs have to hire the best possible players or coaches. The, co the coaching staff is in charge of building perfect team chemistry, designing a playbook, and also performing this exhaustive scouting. And then players are the ones that need to stay healthy, work hard, listen, and at the end, make buckets. So among all these stars, you can see that there are three of them that are green, that this could be achieved, of course, with endless hours of film session videos, but it, those tasks can also be automated through data-driven processes. So let's see what data do we have in the basketball field. And the vast majority of data comes from the official stable. In every single professional basketball game, you have these officials that are writing down everything that happens. The outcome of this official stable can be summarized in three different uh, data sources. The first one is the simple one, that it's box score. This is a summary of everything that happened throughout the game. So you have individual and team performance of like basically everyone and among all possible basketball stats. Then if you want to add the temporal dimension, then you have play-by-play -play or eventing data. And in here you have all the events that happen and also you have some time stamp associated to each event. And finally, if you want to add a special dimension, then you can also have shot charts that is where do players or teams score and shoot from and at what uh, accuracy as well. So among all these cocktail of sources, as I would like to say, we have good, well, good enough data in order to start uh, performing some scouting, but this might be not enough. So let's see this, this clip. This is from NBA Finals in 1998, I would like to say. It was between Utah Jazz and Chicago Bulls. Uh, this is the last play of the game, 15 seconds left. This guy bouncing the ball, he was pretty good. This is Michael Jordan. Uh, uh, Chicago is down by one. Then he calls this ISO play, then crosses up uh, Byron Russell in this case and scores this shot. So according to the traditional data sources that we have, we see that, uh, of course, here, Mike uh, Carmelo committed a turnover, then Jordan stole it, and then Jordan scored this two-point field goal from top of the key. But many more things happen in this sequence. Uh, namely, a uh, coach would like to see that there was this cross screen between corner check and Malone. There was, there was not a defensive switch. There was this low post play designed for Malone to score. There was this double team where Jordan came from baseline from weak side and stole it, then calls this ISO play. And then once being guarded by Baron Russell, he dribbles to his right and then scores this two point open shot pull up step back, which is a bunch of things that happen, but we cannot see it from traditional data sources. That's why a couple of companies, emerge at some point. But before, let me state what we are looking for now. 
we're looking for types of shots in terms of play type, types of shots in terms of difficulty, like it was this shot open or contested. And we want team strategy metrics, defensive metrics, and also defensive assignments. So that's why a new data a source of data, the striking data emerged like in the last decade, more or less. So two companies, namely uh, Second Spectrum and Stats Perform, uh, pr well, provided this service uh, built on top of computer vision and a set of arrays in the ceiling of the arenas that managed to track all players at decent temporal resolution. So here we can see a video of Stats Perform. This is an old video, but still you get the idea, in which all players are tracked. So not only they track, detected, but also tracked because you have an ID for every single player here. And then with this, uh, Tra raw tracking data is sent to teams, and these teams are the ones through data science departments that should convert tracking data uh, well, or use it on their behalf in order to build the competitive advantage that we were talking about before. Okay, so uh, tracking data is super powerful technique, and it makes sense that it's the first stop that we take in this journey of computer vision. Uh, in particular, we made two contributions in terms of tracking data, where we attempted, together with Coloma Ballester and Gloriado, to bring the tracking that exists in the United States here in European basketball. Why? Because of some limitations, intrinsic limitations, that the system of the United States has. That is that it is still not adapted for single camera sequences, where you just have the broadcasting camera and you can uh, uh, gather tracking data from it. And at the same time, if you achieve a single camera tracker, you can also recover tracking data from vintage games. And at the same time, you can still recover like this uh, tracking data from Michael Jordan, that would be pretty nice. So uh, at the same time, we're also facing another limitation that it's salary cap. While in the NBA, all teams have the same budget and it's the same league, the one that's buying this product, tracking products. In Europe, there's an unbalanced market. So we need to find a solution that it's useful for everyone. That's why uh, we would like to call this goal that it's just, we want to build a multi-tracking system based on single camera sequences that manage to track or at least a solid baseline in order to have tracking here in Europe. I'm well aware that also Stack Perform is working on this. Like this research is uh, dates from 2018, 2019. So there has been a lot of evolution in the product auto stats that we might discuss afterwards with Patrick. Uh, but yeah, that, that was our main goal a uh, priori. So this is a little bit the, the pipeline we'll go through in order to track players. We have input frames. So you can see that horizontal line is the temporal domain. The first thing that we need to do is detect the court. And we want to do it because we want to resist, produce the number of candidates to be tracked. So here we have bench players, we have referees, we have also fans, audience. So we are not interested in tracking those. In order to solve this, we are using, and I won't go through much detail here, but we can talk about this afterwards. We're using line segment detection to detect some line segments, then find dominant orientation. And we have an iterative approach with conditional random fields or color filter, depending if we have an NBA game or European game that ends up segmenting the court uh, at notable accuracy. That being said, uh, we have to detect players. And we'll use open post for this, that it's this multi-person detector that was presented in CBPR in 2017, in which you can see here how the post of players is detected. We may have some failure cases like this one, but this is still a decent detection. So we'll stick with this and we'll see the precision afterwards. So uh, at the end, we have up to 25 detected parts per person. We have post, left, right label. So we have basically everything. We have also an associated detection confidence value for each part. And even though we're not gonna use it, we also have one heat map per part, and we also have part affinity fields that encode limb directions. Once all of these players have been detected in across frames, we want to see who is who in this scenario. So we have to extract features to then perform some matching. These features, well, I, I will present three kinds of features. The first one are simple ones, geometrical ones. You can see here two frames. This is a toy example. In the first frame, T1, we have two detected players. And in T2, we have three detected players. So the first type of feature, assuming that temporal resolution is good enough and that displacement across frames are not that large, we can have proximity features. Okay, and we can build this cost CD that takes proximity into account across frames. At the same time, we can uh, improve this, uh, the, well, the, the, the potential of these geometrical features through camera stabilization. Meaning that in this case, we can have reduced intra-player distance across frames. Then uh, apart from geometrical features, Something really interesting is that inside each bounding box, we have a player and this player has a pose. And this pose contains a lot of color information that might be valuable. Like in the chest, like jersey features can express which color the jersey is. Then we have skin tone, we have tattoos, we have hair color, we have a bunch of tasks here that we are not using still. 
So what we might do is for each person here, each player in this case, we center a neighborhood. In, in, in real life, it's smaller than this, but we center a neighborhood and then we compare neighborhoods across the same part of detections across frames. So at the end, we can have also these features that are across features according to color that tell us how much similar or not similar players are. And then we have deep learning features. Uh, imagine that we take the set of the art PCG19 network that was originally trained for image classification. Uh, the main architecture is the following one. So we have an input, square image input. Then we have five convolutional blocks with some convolutional layers. And at the end, we have this classifier built uh, with fully connected layers. Each of these blocks has this amount of filters. And then if we take the output, let's say, of uh, every single second convolutional layer in each of these blocks, the output would have this size. So if we take the output what, while feeding the train network one of our big images, we'll see which are the responses during the feed forward process of the network towards that image. Okay, so let's say, well, the first thing that we need to do though is crop and resize uh, each detection, each player to the desired size. We store post positions and then we will look for deep learning post features. We have this square input 224 by 224. And I will show this example using BGG19 the second layer of the fourth convolutional block. So the output would be 28 by 28 by 512 features that we have here. So we have the pose and we downscale all positions like this is 224. Uh, it's, it's just a reduced image, but it's 224. We downscale, we'll start with the wrist. So we have the wrist position. Then we downscale the toe. We have toe position in the downscale event. And at the end, we have all, all these positions. So for each of these, we have 512 features, which is quite a lot of information to then match players. So we do this for the, let's say, race, and then we keep moving on. And at the end, we may end up with an up to 20, uh, 25 by 512 feature vector per player that is a lot of information. So uh, at the end, we have several parts. We have uh, players in the temporal domain, T1, T2. We apply L2 norm to every single vector here. But here, we might be facing one issue. Since we are downscaling all these positions, we might reach non-integered positions when down sample. So instead of using one by one always, it might be interesting to use two by two neighborhoods, like having at the end a four by five, 12 feature vector per part or three by three neighborhood event. So instead of saying one by five, 12, we'll say N by five, 12, okay? And, and from this, we can build the cost between two parts and we can build the cost between all parts. So we have these deep learning post features that take all deep learning features into account uh, among two boxes. Okay, so we can start matching and uh, we have all features, as I said, geometrical, color, uh, deep learning, we may have more and we merge them together with uh, some weights you can see here. And these weights can be found with a search grid and then when we build this cost matrix of assignments, we want to minimize it. We could apply the Hungarian algorithm, the classical one, but we want to uh, include two frame tolerance. And this means, and this is something that happens in sports sequences where you have overlapping all the time. You may have a detected player in T1. You may have this player not being detected in T2, but this player is detected again in T3. So including this memory says that not only we're checking or comparing the features of T3 with T2, but also T3 with T1. And at the end, we just minimize these assignments and end up having some results. These results are shown with some sequences and possessions that we manually label. So we had full HD resolution, a special one, and we have four FPS in terms of temporal resolution, which is not that high, but this is even more challenging. And then we drag bounding boxes on top of players and we just label them. So we, at, the, at the end, we have more than 10K instances, which was a good number in order to show some metrics. Um, the detection process that this is open pose uh, shows that we detected up to more or less 95% of the boxes. So this F1 score is pretty good and it outperforms other uh, state-of-the-art networks such as YOLO. And then in order to show some tracking results, we'll see it with MOTA, that it's multi-object tracking accuracy, which takes into account false positives, misses, mismatches, against the total number of boxes and also MOTP, that it's uh, the intersection of our union uh, between the, detection, the detections and ground truth boxes. But since detections will be the same ones, no, matters, uh, no matter which features are we extracting, MOTP will be always around 061. 
So these are the obtained results. Uh, you can see here that we have geometrical features, we have color features, and we have deep learning features. There's a whole ablation study about deep learning features in the manuscript that we can mention afterwards if, if, if you want to as well. But uh, just let me mention that we these deep learning features were extracted from the four, uh, second layer of the fourth convolutional block using a two by two neighborhood went down sampling. Okay, so these uh, weights were obtained with this uh, search grid that I mentioned before. And as you can see also here, you can have the effect of stabilizing the camera sequence, which helps geometrical ones. So we can extract several conclusions from here. First one is that uh, deep learning features work better than color features, then that stabilization indeed helps. And when stabilizing the weight of geometrical features increase, which it's quite logical because as I said, it reduces the intra-player distance across frames. And then the combination of geometrical deep learning and color features is the one providing better results. But this better result is just of a matter of 0 0.002. So it's not worth it to compute color features with add some computational expenses and we'll stick with just geometrical and deep learning features. So this is uh, one sample of, of results. As you will see here, we have some bounding boxes that express the detections and then the color is the ID. So I will play it once without saying anything because I have to drink at some point. Uh, but uh, you will see that it's challenging because there's here, there's an Iverson cut. Then this same player performs some stagger. There's some high low, uh, high low situation here. There's zone difference, there's overlapping, there's everything. So just uh, let me play it and I will mention it in, in a few seconds. All right, so it's it's pretty hard to to grasp some details just with one 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 play. But uh, let's focus now. Just I will play it again on this player, this big player from Ceska Moscow. He performs several actions here. He, here he goes like he he gets open. He doesn't receive the ball. He goes down. He screens the shooter here. But as you can see throughout all this sequence, this player maintains the whole idea. So we could say that we built a solid baseline tracker for single camera sequences, being deep learning features better than color ones. But I would say for professional purposes, we need a better MOTA. In the manuscript, I said that it should be higher than 0 0.95. But the more I think about it, the more I think that this should be really close to 1. Because you cannot miss much instances, for instance, in a ball screen situation. In terms of future work, uh, we will perform more tests. With higher FPS, this should improve a little bit. We, we need more cameras, but I'm not talking about 8, 10 cameras. I'm talking about broadcasting cameras. And maybe with three, we have some 3D correspondences, but this might be helpful. And then we can also take into account proximity features as normalized court coordinates instead of uh, field pixels, uh, pixels in the image. So that would help as well. And finally, another idea is to train the whole thing end to end. But in order to fine tune existing serial VR models, we found out that there's this lack of sports tracking data sets, at least open ones, in order to do so. Just to give some closure to this first part, let me just recap all the things we've seen. So we have companies or we have computer vision based methods that track players in given sports, not only basketball. And from now on, I will switch the whole presentation into soccer. Uh, and then these companies or these computer vision methods send road tracking data to teams. And these teams may have data separated uh, data science departments that are the ones crunching the numbers and communicating them through the coach, coaching staff in order to generate this competitive advantage that we were talking at the beginning. That being said, there are some questions here. That, uh, maybe the first one is, is to the data, uh, to the tracking data powerful enough? Or maybe do we have unexploited data in the existing footage, in the existing frames that could be used in order to generate a better competitive advantage? Well, the truth is that luckily, yes. And in this research, in this thesis, We've been uh, doing a lot of research on orientation estimation. So not only this player is at X, Y, position X, Y, but he or she is also facing towards a particular number of degrees. We've made three contributions here, three conference papers, uh, together with uh, Adrián Martín, Javier Fernández, Carlos Rodríguez, Pablo Granero, and again, Florian Puloma. And uh, as, as I will present in a minute, uh, we have a model-based approach in order to estimate orientation and a learning-based one. So why orientation? Uh, it's because of some words that Pep Guardiola said some years ago. As you know, Pep Guardiola is the former FC Barcelona coach, and we love him very much here, yada, yada. And he said that elder people claim that yesteryear soccer, so a long time ago, 
players used to first control the ball, then look around and finally make the pass. But this change in the modern, faster version of soccer, where orientation is the most important thing at the beginning, and then you, you can do the rest. So even though orientation seems to be a vital skill for soccer players, and even though there have been like really top match contributions in sports analytics, like uh, this expected position value framework of Javier Fernandez or uh, visualization tools from Manuel Stein, still body orientation is a missing piece of information. So we can enrich tracking data and set of the art models with a new layer. So as you can see here, this is a toy example again, but you can see three defenders of FC Barcelona. And if we don't have orientation data, we have this blue scenario and we don't know the output of this pass. And it's crystal clear that this player is gonna pass to, 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 towards his right because the whole body is pointing towards that player. So we want to switch from this blue scenario to this yellow scenario. So what is orientation? That might be tricky and we just uh, come up with, with this solution. Orientation for us is we take the upper torso that is defined with shoulders and hips, and then we extract the 3D vector from the middle of this upper torso. But we will be talking about orientation in 2D. So uh, we will be talking about the 2D projection of this 3D vector in this space. And as you can see here, this is our reference system that is the one that I will use from now on. Um, besides, we have data across domains. So we have sensor data uh, that emits not only tracking data with uh, latitude and longitude uh, units, but also orientation ground for data. And on the other hand, we have image domains. So we have uh, things in the pixels. We have these players that we have to detect, and then we have to extract orientation. In order to merge all these domains, what we suggest is to bring everything use, using uh, core correspondences and homographies to bring everything to the field domain. And then in this field domain, you can build up your models. Um, in particular, you can have several types of data sets. You may have an ideal one, you may have a non-ideal one. We, in the manuscript, we also talk about this whole pipeline based on this, uh, well, all these steps that end up creating a complete data set out of an, a non-synchronized one. So we can talk about this afterwards, but just it merges image domain, central domain into the field domain to end up having synchronized data. As I said, we have two main contributions here. The first one is the model-based one that involves no training and it's highly interpretable and easy to customize in which we have this almost computer, fully computer vision based pipeline in which we have two estimations of orientation. The first one is pose orientation in which we use once again open pose in order to detect the pose of players. And we detect the pose of these players inside this footage. And as you can see, there are these tiny image crops that belong to players. So in order to have a better resolution of them, the first thing that we need to do as well is uh, apply a, a super resolution network in order to enhance the quality of these tiny image crops a little bit. Um, once this image is enhanced and we found out the pose of these players, we detect shoulders, we detect hips, and using homography, so using corner data and a 2D field template, we map these positions to the 2D field template. So let's start with the shoulders. We, we map one shoulder, we map the other one, and then we can build this normal vector that just gives our first estimate of orientation that in this case is 283 degrees. Besides, we also have a confidence value that comes from the confidence that was associated to each part of open pose. Besides, we have uh, the same here with hips. We do it, and in this case, uh, shoulders tell us that this player is at 283 degrees and according to hips, 295. So this is more or less the same, and we just stick with the one with, of higher confidence. But this is the ideal case, and of course, there are some drawbacks. There is maybe this one that, as you can see, there's, this player is placed sideways from the camera post perspective. Um, according to shoulders, this player is facing towards 222 degrees, but according to hips, is facing 81 degrees, which is the other way around. So in order to solve it, we use data from the image domain, and uh, in particular, we check the, the, the difference in the x-axis between the neck and all face positions to end up saying that this player is facing less, left, and we do an average, and then we say that this player is facing towards 201 degrees. So we have another drawback, uh, of course, uh, that is that at that low resolution, still open pose has some trouble finding the correct pose. And sometimes the left-right parts of the body might be swapped. So we have the right side and the left side and vice versa. So in order to overcome this issue, we train a super vector machine classifier based on color features and also geometrical features that uh, learns how to classify front looking, side looking and back, back, back looking, not bad looking, back looking players. Okay, so uh, this is this course corroboration that we apply once this uh, estimation has been performed, and then we can build some probability vector. Um, 
we want to express orientation as probability vectors with some Gaussian support. So the first thing that we need to do is cluster similar angles. So in this case, I will show this example of 24 bins, each bin uh, containing 15 degrees. And then we have angle and confidence for each single detection. The angle here will help us know in which position of this probability vector do we have the highest weight. And then the confidence will express us uh, the Gaussian support of this uh, probability vector. If we have higher confidence, we have a Gaussian that would be like a peak. And then if we have low confidence, this would be like a flat Gaussian, like in this example that we have here. We formally express this uh, with these couple of parameters. So we have NP, that it's the number of non-zero bins that this depends on CP, that is the associated confidence. And then we have ORP, that depends on alpha P, that it's the uh, post estimation orientation that we have just made. Okay, once we have this probability uh, vector, we have to uh, merge it with the second estimation of orientation that we do. And this is just a bias that attempts or aims to uh, compute the orientation towards the ball. There's this bias that if you have the ball really close and you're playing, you have to pay attention of what is going on with the ball at all times. So uh, we create this second vector, the second probability vector with this couple of parameters that takes this into account. So uh, we have NB that uh, takes into account the pairwise distance between the player PXPY and the ball VXPY, and also takes into account the ma maximum distance, this threshold, that is the maximum distance that a player should be in order not to be affected by the ball position in terms of orientation. Besides, we have ORB, that it's a bin with higher weight, that depends on this beta, that it's the 2D angle in the field between the ball and the player. So we have both vectors of the same size. We can merge them again with a search grid. We can give some weights and we can validate these results. And we'll do it with youth games. Like we had one youth game that was recorded at full HD resolution and it also contained ground truth oriented orientation data coming from EPTS devices. In particular, we were using Wemo real track systems. And then we can compare our estimations with this ground truth orientation data. Let's see uh, some results. Here you can see the arrows. I hope you can see it. Yeah, kind of. Uh, these yellow arrows belong to our estimations. And afterwards, you will see green arrows belonging to ground truth data. Uh, in this case, we have a mean absolute error of 29 degrees and a median absolute error of 27, which is a promising baseline. But still, we're facing some limitations. The first one is that this is still open post dependent. So if we have a bounding box and we don't detect any kind of post, we have no orientation. Then we have some level of overfitting in terms of jersey features because we only train it for FC Barcelona. And then we don't know how this would behave with uh, challenging camera poses. So at the end, we still have room for improvement in terms of, of median absolute error. That uh, this is what leads us to the second model that it's a learning based one that I explained in a minute. Okay, let's go. Um, so this second model or approach. Uh, involves some training, but it also has higher accuracy in potential generalization. The main reason of the second approach was that until this point, we are using sensor data just for validation, but we weren't using it for training. So we want to switch from this uh, detection approach, estimation approach, towards classification approach. This means that imagine that we have this spectrum here from 0 to 360 degrees, and we split into bin. If we have one, one image crop like this one, and we know that this player is facing a particular number of degrees, uh, let's say 144, this player can be assigned to this class. This is class number eight. We have another one that if he's logging 309 degrees, this is class number two. Okay, so at the end, we have a normal classification scheme. Like we have an input, that is this image crop, and also this ground truth orientation belonging to this class. We fine tune a network, and then we can output an orientation. This seems simple enough, but we have to overcome some, some limitations here or some challenges. Uh, the first one is angle compensation. Imagine that we have all these three players. I will zoom in. Uh, and these three players, they look really different, but all of them are facing towards zero degrees. And this is because of the camera pose. Depending on where is the camera facing, then the zero axis changes as well. In order to solve this beforehand, uh, what we're doing is build an apparent vector. So this is a geometrical solution. We build this uh, horizontal line in the image domain. We map these positions also of player orientation in a 2D field using homographies through corner data. And then here we have the real zero axis, so horizontal line. And we also have this apparent zero axis. So we can find this compensation between these axes and apply it on top of angle of player orientation. And we can bring it back so we know the compensated uh, orientation of this player. Then uh, we need to fine tune a network. We didn't have enough data to train our own from scratch. And we decided to use again BCG19. 
And this this choice was not random because uh, BGC19 was used in open posts you know, as a backbone to strike features that then they led to the detection of the post. So it has something to do with the human skeleton that has something to do, of course, with the orientation. I won't repeat the architecture because I said it before, but basically our choice in order to fine tune this network was to freeze the weights in the first and second blocks, retrain the third block and also the classifier as well as reshaping to the number of beams that we have uh, orientation beams and we omitted the rest. Um, this again seems like a random black box deep learning choice, but uh, I, I can assure you it's not. So we checked uh, activation weights uh, with SCORECAM. And as you can see here, these are the responses uh, after some convolutional layers in block one, block three, block four. And as you can see, red pixels belong to no response and blue pixels belong to high response. In block one, some shapes, uh, edges, lines are detected. In block three, some meaningful semantic information regarding player orientation is detected. You can see back, you can see legs, chest, so on. And then blocks four and five, what we found out is that in many image crops, there, was high, there were high responses in the background, so in the grass, which has little to do with orientation and indicated that this might be overfitting. So uh, we also used grayscale images in order not to have uh, jersey limitations. And we use data augmentation in terms of random brightness and contrast changes. Uh, and at the end, we had to choose a loss function. And this loss function, I'm going to just use a toy example. But if we use a gold standard data set, such as, I don't know, ImageNet in this case, uh, we don't know the distance across classes. Because we have so many classes, it's really difficult to quantify it. So we use one hot encoding for training, meaning that this panda is just a panda. It's not a tennis ball, of course. Or this car is just a car. So uh, instead, in our case, we know the distance across classes because we build these orientation bins. So instead of using this one hot encoding, we might use, uh, use soft labels. And these soft labels, what this will do is just express or just show uh, labels for each of these bounding boxes with a mixture of classes. And let me just say or show you this uh, toy example again, that is, imagine that we have three players inside the second bin that goes from 30 to 60 degrees. We may have player A facing 45 degrees. So this is a perfect example of a player inside bin number two. But we may have player B facing 31, which is a mixture, perfect mixture almost between bin one and two. Or we might have this player C facing 59 uh, degrees, that it's a mixture between bins two and three. So at the end, uh, if we use these soft labels, we can reduce the intrinsic grouping error. Um, and besides, there's another uh, feature here about this cyclic loss that is that uh, given that one degree and 359 degrees are really close together in angular space, we can, if, if we're doing it on our own, we can make it as well in terms of bin. So bin one and bin 12 are actually neighbors. Formally, we express it like this, where you can see that this loss function, what it's computing, is the cyclic distance between ground truth orientation, so coming from sensors, and also the central bin values of all bins that we have. Okay, and you can see here that this is cyclic because we are computing the minimum of the, that distance and, and uh, the other distance with 360 degrees. Then uh, it, it's now time for, for training already, but uh, we only had two different games at our disposal. And ideally, we would, we would have liked to just train it with one game and test it with the other one. But there was concept breadth here. As you can see, the top row uh, includes a lot of JPEG artifacts. Uh, so we are not using super resolution here. So our solution was instead using unbalanced sets, meaning that 90% of data in the training process is from one game, and that is the same one used for validation, and just the 10% remaining uh, will be from the game that will test this model. So at the end, this will give us some insights about the potential generalization to unseen data that this network has. Um, we performed several experiments. Uh, I will show you here the most relevant ones. We can see the white one that is 12 bins with compensation and compensation and also cyclic loss. Another one with 24 bins, another one with one hot encoding, another one without angle compensation, and another one instead of using BCG19 using DenseNet. So you can see here validation results, mean absolute error and median absolute error. In this sense, the, the one providing the, the, the smallest error is uh, with 24 bins which makes sense because if you create more bins, you have less degrees per bin. And at the end, you are reducing the intrinsic error that we've been talking about. But then once we are testing, you can see that these 24 bins experiment overfits a little. And the one providing best results is the one with 12 bins that achieves less than 12 degrees of median absolute error. At the same time, you can see how the choices of not using uh, 
one hot encoding and using an angle compensation actually help the model uh, learning better. Besides the architecture of PCG19, also proves in this case to work better than DenseNet. But at the same time, if we keep trying with DenseNet with uh, freezing some weights, training other ones, we might reach similar results. In the bottom row, you can see the computer vision. So the model-based approach that I showed you before without the super vector machines in order to perform the course corroboration. So you can see how this is the one performing the worst. Um, we could say then that we build reliable orientation simulation methods being the learning based one, the, the better one with less than 12 degrees of median absolute error. We don't have jersey limitations in terms of color and we compensated angles in order to handle properly extreme camera poses. And at the same time, we're preserving an angular behavior with this cyclic loss. And with unbalanced sets, we have seen that this network is able to generalize pretty well to unseen data. Um, so now what? This is the main question. And, and the first thing that comes to mind is just building raw orientation pool based maps. And we have a whole chapter about this in the, in the manuscript. But still, like in this case, I, I will explain it a little bit. Uh, we, we may have orient sonars, that is how do players receive passes in terms of uh, orientation. Reaction maps, that is how does the orientation change between the moment of the pass and the moment of reception. And also, uh, the, the orientation of players with respect to the goal in passes would be on, on field maps. And we can even characterize more these uh, orient sonars, for instance. We can, and these are real maps, like we can build it from expe with expected position value. We can filter with build up middle phase progression phases, but still we have not uh, fulfilled our claim, initial claim that is, is orientation that important? Like uh, we've been doing all this stuff, but we still have not proven. Proven it. So if so, how much? And we need to contextualize it. In order to do so, we reach the last part of, of this thesis, uh, that is pass visibility. That is from orientation, we build some pass-based tools that can assess if orientation is important. And at the same time, we kind of predict the feasibility in some spaces of the, of the field. So we've made two contributions here. There is a, a conference paper and also a journal paper. Uh, in which we present a discrete states and a continuous states, uh, continuous feasibility models. And we've been working again with Adrian Martin, Javier Fernandez, Coloma, and Gloria. Um, basically, I will show it again. Uh, we had this toy example. And again, we want to switch from this blue scenario to the yellow one. And we want to build the first pass based assessment tool with orientation as a core feature. And we'll be using the learning based model in order to estimate player body orientation. I will show you another example here. Uh, you will see that this is not from last weekend because we have Messi, we have Suarez, and we have Griezmann, so we have zero of three. And you will see how orientation changed everything. Uh, first, Suarez in the, is in the field of view of Messi, but then Messi changes orientation, and then all of a sudden, it's Griezmann the best candidate to receive the ball. Right? So then uh, Griezmann is able to score this goal out of this change of orientation. So we want to measure this. We want to see how much important it is. Um, so we're going to build pass feasibility models. They, they compute how safe it is a priori to pass the ball towards a particular receiver or field spot. We made this couple of contributions. Um, the first one is a discrete stage one. And I won't go through much detail because I think the other one is more interesting, but still I, I will mention the, the basics in which we have one passer and then 10 receiving candidates. So this is a cheap model that involves no training in which if we have tracking and orientation data, we assume that the best position candidate to receive the ball is the one uh, combining three features. So the first one is orientation, which is the best orientation fit. In order to compute so, uh, we built uh, cones on top of each receiver towards the, the orientation. And at the same time, we do the same for the passer. Uh, in order to find the best orientation fit, what we're doing is bring players to a unit circle, so equidistant distance, and then we can build or compute the intersection between cones. And in this case, with, well, with this integral, we can find out that player seven is the one providing the best orientation fit between the passer and all potential receivers. Then we also check defensive pressure, and this is improved in the other model, but we are checking defensive pressure in the passing lines from the perspective of the passer and also from the perspective of the receiver. And at the end, we have like one defensive metric. And finally, we also want to express this bias that it's if you're close to the ball, you have higher chances of receiving it than if you are far away. So at the end, you have three individual feasibility values. So orientation and defensive pressure and also proximity. But you have this receiving feasibility for each candidate at their current field spot. So we're not taking into account yet open spaces or defenders orientation. 
And that's why we get working and we build this continuous feasibility model that builds these past feasibility maps. So we have one passer and you have one receiving metric in all field spots, including open spaces. It includes, this method includes some hyperparameter tuning, uh, but it's still highly easy to interpret. Um, this is the equation of past feasibility maps, this MX being X of positions in the field. And here we may have, well, we have several contributions. We have the offensive one and we have the defensive one, but also inside the offensive contribution, we have passer and receiver contribution. So we'll check each of these individually to end up knowing what does the past feasibility map contain. Um, let's start with the passer. This passer, well, we have this equation, we have this 10 yellow potential receivers, and we also have this passer here that is the one carrying the ball. And um, this passer, uh, we can model where is he gonna pass with two parameters. So we assume that we have this passer at position P and orientation alpha P. The first thing that we model is passing reach. And this passing reach is how far can this player pass to? So uh, we build it just with this Gaussian that takes into account the pairwise distance between all field positions and the position of the passer, and also the sigma p that indicates how, how, how big this Gaussian is. Okay, I will mention about, uh, I, I will talk about the sigma p afterwards. And then we have also orientation. So it's among all these positions that are included in this passing reach, where is this player really gonna pass to? Like, what is the field of view of this player? And this could be built with this cone, but it's not the, our uh, approach, but instead we build it with this, with this other Gaussian. This is taking into account the angle between every field spot and the passer position with respect to the orientation of the passer. And then we have this denominator that it's just to decrease backwards locations, but I, I will talk about this afterwards. You don't have to worry about this now. Um, so we can combine uh, passing reach and orientation to end up having this passer map that it's the most likely positions where the, the passer will move the ball towards. Great, so we have the passer. Let's move on to receivers now. We have 10 receivers and their current field spot and orientation, and we have more or less the same parameters. So we have receiver J at position RJ and orientation alpha RJ. We have the receiving reach that's almost the same as passing reach, but the denominator changes that it's how far can I move in order to get the ball. And also we have these cones again, that it's orientation, that it's expressed in the same way as, as, as before. So we have these for every single uh, receiver. And once we have all of them, uh, we can merge them together and have a receiver map. So this receiver map on their own, it might not be that, in, that easy to understand or interpret, but we can merge it just uh, building the offensive team map that just combines passer and receivers map. And this ends up being this, this MO that just, you can see the yellowish positions are the ones with higher associated feasibility in which the passer will move the ball towards. But defense may have something to do here. Uh, so we, we have to model it somehow. And it, this is different because uh, imagine that we have this particular scenario, but this is different because we don't want to model these cones of receivers running towards open spaces. Instead, the goal of defenders is not to commit any faulty movements that create these open spaces. So what we're gonna build is these double-sided Gaussians with matching contour lines that then, uh, as you can see, there's this narrow part there, it's backside, and then you have this large part that it's front side. So for a defender I at position DI and orientation beta DI, we build this rotation that finds which positions in the field are frontwards and which ones are backwards. And this helps us build this uh, for, for each defender, each, each of these double-sided Gaussians. So you have the top case that it's the, the uh, backside of one, and then you have the bottom case that it's the front side of one. So at the end, you have these kind of avocados here that end up creating the defensive map. And there's another parameter that I have to mention here that we are taking into account that it's the denominator of these uh, double-sided Gaussians also depends on the pairwise distance between the ball and the defender or the passer and the defender. And this is because if you are close to the ball, you're a defender and there's a short pass, you won't have much time to react. But if you are far away, you can move uh, a little bit uh, farther. So at the end, we have this defensive map and we can bring everything together into one pass feasibility map by adding the contributions of the offensive team and defensive team together. And as, as you can see here, MO offense, MG defense, and MX is the final pass feasibility map in which you can see how yellow positions are the ones with higher associated feasibility and the bluish ones are the ones with the lowest one. And you can see, and I will mention about, uh, I will talk about this in a minute, but you have here this kappa that is a factor that will just uh, balance both ranges. Um, 
As I said, we have several parameters to discuss, and this was also included in the manuscript. I don't have much time now to discuss, but uh, we have the offensive Gaussian size that was the denominator in the Gaussians in the passing reach and the receiving reach of offensive players. And this was able to model the spatial reach of passers and receivers, of course. And this was set beforehand. And this was said in a way that the passing reach is higher than the receiving reach because you can kick the ball really far away, but you cannot run that much far away at the same speed. Then we also have the offensive angle compensation that this is also said beforehand, the sigma a, that this decreases visibility in backwards locations in the case of offensive players. So in the orientation of not only uh, the passer, but also receivers. If we don't have anything here and we just consider it to be one, the feasibility of passing or running backwards might be around 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And it's not that much, like it's a rare event. So uh, we have to set it, and, or we set it in this case to 0 0.75 or 0 0.5. And the last couple of parameters that these ones are trained during a training process are the defensive size. So how big this double-sided Gaussian should be, and also the offensive boost weight kappa. So this kappa is here because uh, in the case of offense, we have the product of the passer with all receivers. And in the case of defense, we just have the sum of several layers of defensive players. So at the end, the range of offense is smaller than the other one. And with this kappa, we can make it more or less equal. So we had nine complete games with tracking and eventing data. Uh, this ended up having more than, well, more or less 5,000 successful passes. We didn't include non-successful passes because of their nature, that it's diverse. It can be a bad pass. But reception, it can be a good pass, but there was an awesome uh, defensive performance. So we stick just with the uh, successful passes. And we use 80% of these passes events uh, for training and the 20% remaining ones for testing. Um, in order to provide some results, we should first estimate a receiving feasibility around each potential receiver and then have some kind of accuracy. Um, this receiving feasibility, we suggest three different uh, well, we made three different suggestions. The first one is disk evaluation. So around each receiver, we can center this disk and we can integrate all the positions in the past feasibility map at that position. And this will provide us like one feasibility per player. Then we might say that these disks are not the actual receiving areas of players. So we might adapt it with kernel density estimation and just find some areas that might be more suitable and, and we do more or less the same. And then we can also have binary kernel density estimation that is kernel density estimation being thresholded at some value. Um, with that, we sort all the feasibilities that we have for all players here uh, in a given event. And we check in order to have some accuracy the, if the actual receiver matches the output of the model. So if the actual receiver is A, and according to sorted feasibilities, the, the, the most likely candidate to get the ball is A, this is top one correct, should be top three correct, top five correct, and so on. If according to our model, uh, player A is the third option, this is top one incorrect, top three, two incorrect, top three correct, and so on, and this would happen the same with all, all positions. So we can repeat this for all the set of passes that we have, and we can compute this uh, accuracy as a straightforward percentage in top one and top three, let's say. These are the results that we obtained. Uh, as you can see, we have continuous results and discrete results uh, according to the two contributions that we made. I will start with the continuous ones in which you can see how we have different evaluations, uh, this KDE, binary KDE. And more important here, you can see that some maps have been built using orientation and the other ones didn't use orientation. Um, we have here the values of the parameters that were trained during this tuning process. And at the end, you can have, uh, you can see here, the top one and top three results in terms of training and testing. We may extract several conclusions from here. The first one is that when not using orientation, there's a huge drop, almost 0 0.2. So it's worth it to use orientation. Then uh, top, well, in terms of training and testing, we obtain more or less the same results. So there's some generalization here. We, we are not training much, just a couple of parameters. And then we are reaching 0 0.45, 46 in top one and 0 0.78, 79 in top three, which are decent results in order to predict the output of the pass. Also, discrete, uh, the discrete states model that we created before, uh, it's not, uh, not worse, of course, that pass feasibility maps without orientation, but it is still not performing that great. So we'll stick with just pass feasibility maps from now on. Um, and also in the, in the manuscript, we also show how to add other features in the map score in order to make it adjust better to some particular scenarios. So we analyze the passing biases. If you have a star player in your team, he or she might receive many more passes just because he or she is awesome. And maybe it's she or he or she is not in the best position to get the ball, but she gets it. And then we also have player speed. 
that it's, we didn't include it in the original maps, but we also show how to do it just without tuning anything else, just adding some equations in the original maps. And besides, we also did uh, analysis of game positions of faces in which we found out that the most affected players of orientation it's are forwards, which makes sense because they are in risky positions where proper orientation really makes a difference. And the same, same happens with faces in which finalization phase is the one more affected by orientation. Then as conclusions of this last part, we could say that we built this first pass based tool with orientation uh, as a core feature. And this is useful to check if orientation really makes a difference or not in past events. We built this robust 2D feasibility maps that almost reach 0.8 in top three accuracy that out, uh, outperform discrete states, thus showing that really open spaces matter uh, and, and play a vital role. Also, orientation matters, and we want to quantify it. It depends on the situation, but more or less is a 0.2 push. And this has high potential, and this is future world. This has high potential across sports, but we may have to check other events. We could check uh, orientation or past feasibility uh, maps in basketball, but maybe passes are not the most likely event to be drastically affected by orientation. We could check in basketball the orientation of weak side defense. We can check uh, ball screen situations, how this, the, the screening angle change and so on. And this would have like this high potential. So we reach the end of this complete journey of computer vision uh, in sports. I would like to give some closure and just recap everything that we have seen. So in this journey, we have seen in the first part how to gather tracking data uh, from single camera sequences at decent uh, MOTA. Then we have in the second part enrich this 2D tracking data with a new dimension or a new layer that it's uh, player body orientation. And then we have seen how with this player body orientation, we can create the first orientation based, based passing tool. And in terms of contributions, we, we have these seven papers, seven main contributions at least. Uh, in the first part, we have two conference papers that they defer on the feature extraction process that I explained. In the second part, we have the contributions that I mentioned that it was the model-based and the learning-based approach in order to infer body orientation. And in the third part, we have seen uh, the discrete states model and the continuous pass feasibility maps model in order to model pass feasibility. Um, this PhD is, is over, hopefully, but uh, I have some future lines of research that I would like to mention. I had some, some ideas to keep working with that. Uh, first of all, individual or collective action recognition. I think it's a really nice idea in order to say not only this player is uh, X, Y facing towards that many degrees, but he or she is also jumping, screening, uh, uh, shooting. And this could lead to proper definitions of other metrics, such as open and contested shots in basketball, that it's really tough to find a really uh, the precise uh, definition. Then video summarization and action spotting. I think it's also a really promising field. And if you like that, uh, you should check SoccerNet, that it's a large data set that they, uh, there's a, a group of people that they organize some challenges and it's pretty cool. Then despite I'm, I'm not a big fan of video games, I think that video game data, it's also really useful or could be really useful in order to enlarge data sets. Because after all, you have an endless resource of ground truth data. You have three dimensions, you have orientation, you have everything. And they really look like real life. Um, afterwards, uh, also generalization across sports should be checked. And all, not only basketball and soccer, but other ones. I've been talking about tracking in two dimensions and also orientation in two dimensions. But obviously, there's this Z dimension that should be checked at some point as well. And then there's this fun project that I want to do at some point that is player similarity with respect to their post. This means that all basketball coaches say that the best uh, NBA shooter ever was Ray Allen because of the elbow, yada, yada, there are some, some parameters, so on. But we have no tools in order to prove how similar to you should with respect to Ray Allen. So this should be fun to do at some point. Um, of course, there's this list of further contributions that it's extended in the manuscript. Uh, this this uh, contributions might fall out of the scope of the PhD, but I've been doing some research on how to disseminate uh, advanced statistics through coaches uh, with some GitHub repositories. I've also organized or gave some talks like the invited talk of computer vision in sports workshop this year. And I've also had the chance of teaching and also directing some workshops and tutorials, which was really enriching. And after all, like it's, one, it's been four years. It's been a hell of a ride. I had a lot of fun and, and I learned a lot. Thanks for your attention. These are my contact details if you want to reach me out at some point. And I'm already looking forward to the Defense Committee questions. Thanks.